Okay, so our moderator for the next panel is Rick Mitchell. And I can't really give you all the details because Joe Nick took my notes, but I will tell you that he is, he is absolutely incredible. He was, a, he was the music writer here for the Houston Chronicle for 10 years. He's also been writing all for, he's, he's written for publications all over the world about jazz. He's written two books, okay, uh, including one with Johnny Bush on Whiskey River and another one, The New Millennium, Jazz, The New Millennium. Those books are available, by the way, during your breaks at the Jung Center Bookstore table. There's two tables out there that have books from all of our speakers. If you look inside your program, it has a list of all the books we have for sale. Rick is also a co-curator of this conference. He and Roger Wood and I and Tanya DeBose and all of the other folks on my HHA pirate ship have been working very hard on this conference. And Rick and Roger have done yeoman's work connecting us within the community here. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to present to you the great Rick Mitchell. <laughs> One more time for Joe Nick. That was spectacular. Yeah, th the only problem is he didn't leave anything for the rest of us to talk about. Uh, I'm Rick Mitchell. As uh, Cecilia pointed out, I was the music critic at the Houston Chronicle for 10 years. Uh, I have, I've written three books. I was the director of the Houston International Festival for several years. Now, however, I'm just Mr. Mitchell, 11th grade English teacher at Lamar High School. So, yeah, thank you for coming. As, jo as Joe Nick pointed out, you're the people who care. And again, for those of us who care, it's nice that there are people who come who also care. I want to introduce this distinguished panel that we have here. Th uh, this is something special to have these people up here together. This is Lizette Cobb, uh, historian. Her father, Arnett Cobb, was featured in Joe Nick's presentation. He's the king of the Houston tenors. Next to him, Craig Green. Craig Green, longtime jazz drummer, played with the Kashmir Stage Band, the best high school stage band ever of all time anywhere. Also taught for about 30 years at Johnson Middle School. There are now drummers that he taught that are the greatest jazz drummers in New York today, and we'll talk about them in a little bit. Next to him, Robert Doc Morgan, the legendary <laughs> director of the Houston High School for the Performing and Visual Arts Jazz Program. A lot of the drummers that Craig taught then went to Doc, then went to college, and now they're, yeah, working all over the world. Now they're gonna take care of us and our, you know. <laughs> and on the end, Shelly Carroll, uh, yeah. jazz tenor player, Shelley also went to HSPVA. He is really the link between the earlier generation of Texas tenor players and the current generation of musicians. Shelley's back living in Houston now. He's a graduate student at the University of Houston. He's also uh, taking care of his mother. And when he's not in town here, he's on the road with two different bands. One is the Duke Ellington Orchestra, now under the direction of Duke's grandson. The other is Cool and the Gang. Wow. <laughs> So, uh, without further ado, let's hear Arnett Cobb.
that's what you call Texas tenor. Uh, a lot of where that sound comes from, uh, jazz sax players in this town often had the opportunity to come up playing with rhythm and blues bands. Sometimes there was no amplification, and so they developed this big sound that could kind of knock a wall down without a mic. Uh, that particular recording we heard was from a, an album recorded in 1946 or 1947 called Arnett Blows for 1300. And for decades now, people have wondered what, the, what, what does it mean for 1300, and nobody really knows, but the best anybody can come up with is that's what he was paid for the gig. <laughs> well, what do you want to call this album? Why don't you call it Arnett Blows for 1300? Yeah, I, I, I first heard Arnett at Carnegie Hall in New York City. He was playing with the Lionel Hampton Big Band uh, in a uh, memorial or, or an anniversary concert of the legendary Benny Goodman concert at Carnegie Hall. It was really the first integrated jazz performance, uh, at least on a major scale, in the United States. As Joe Nick pointed out, white musicians and black musicians have been playing together as long as there's been America. But because of legal segregation, it, it was difficult sometimes to do it publicly. That concert broke the barrier. And uh, they were commemorating it. And he, I, I remember when I moved to Houston, thinking I couldn't wait to hear Arnett again. Unfortunately, he passed right before I got here. And one of the first concerts I reviewed in my new job as the music critic at the Houston Chronicle was a tribute to Arnett Cobb at the Miller Outdoor Theater with uh, three saxophone players, Billy Harper, who was the first black graduate from North Texas State University, and Wilton Felder, the tenor player with the Jazz Crusaders, later the Crusaders, and Shelley Carroll down here on the end. Young man with a horn. So, Lizette, tell us a little bit about your dad. Well, my dad was, first of all, let me say good morning, and thank you so much for allowing us to share with you. Um, my dad is a native Houstonian. He was born here uh, August the 10th, 1918. He went to, you saw the picture, Bruce Elementary School. And then he went to Phyllis Wheatley, which was then called the Old Colored High. And that's where he met a lot of the gentlemen that he would grow up with. And they would go out with Lionel Hampton and the other bands and make their way in the world. Uh, Eddie Vincent, um, Illinois. But they also did a lot of work with Milton Larkin, who is a very interesting man, and I uh, hope you get to learn a lot about him as well. But he was really like a godfather to my dad, because my father was run over by a car when he was 10 years old. He was at the Majestic Theater. Back then, they would go to matinees, and in between the matinees, they would have live music. Well, he got hungry. So he rushed across the street to get a sandwich, and he was rushing back, and he got hit by a car. So um, he had a lot of calamities after that, and my grandmother did not want him to play or leave, but Milton was the one who convinced he, uh, him, her rather, that he could go out in the world. So he did, and he played uh, in a territorial band at that time, that's what they called them, which I think was what, Wick, Oklahoma, Louisiana, yeah, barnstorming territory band. Texas, that kind of thing. And from there, he went to Lionel Hampton. He stayed there five years. And then from there, he formed his own group called the Arnett Cobb and the Mob. But when he was with Lionel, he was called the Wild Man from Texas. Um, in 1956, the year that I was born, my father had a terrible accident. And that's why you see some of the pictures where he's bending his legs, and then you see others where he looks stiff. He, that was the condition that he was in back then, because orthopedic surgery, as you know now, is miraculous. But back then, it was not. So um, I think of my dad as a type of hero for me, because he loved the music so much, he would not give up, and he didn't care what kind of shape his body was in. As long as his lips could get around that horn, he, he was going to play. So he did Arnett Cobb and the Mob, and he had some other illnesses in between then. But he recorded. He didn't travel as much. 
He owned his own club here, right? Yeah, well, he managed the club on Dowling. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of the Ebony. I know we talk a lot about mm -hmm. the El Dorado, mm -hmm. but there were other clubs, and the Ebony was right there on Dowling. As a matter of fact, right around the corner from my house. So he did bring his friends in, <laughs> mm -hmm. and they partied. Um, <laughs> he recorded for, uh, he started recording with the Apollo label, and then he moved to Prestige, and then Prestige ended up being, now is Concord Records. But um, recording and playing around Houston, well, he lived in New York, okay, when he was with Lionel Hampton. Then he moved here, um, I guess it must have been around 1960 something, somewhere around 1960 something. And he also suffered another illness, but he, got all right and he started, that's when he started managing the Ebony and he recorded, like I said, and played around town. And I mean, he played everywhere. I probably know every joint, dive, ice house, <laughs> strip club, <laughs> uh, everything around Market Square. I mean, he, but that's what you do. When you are a musician, you work, you play music wherever, wedding, bar mitzvah, Funeral, mm -hmm. church, you name it. Anyway, he, he played around Houston a lot, but there was a lot of conversation in Europe about where was Arnett Todd. So in the 70s, if I remember correctly, he started touring again, and he started touring in Europe, and it went really well for him. And as a matter of fact, that's when I was able to go with him, and I traveled with him because he needed help. You know, he was uh, on crutches. And I cannot tell you what an experience that was. It changed my life forever. That is the lens and the language of how I understand the world is through music, you know. And I met so many wonderful people and still continue to meet wonderful people. But he, okay, he went to Europe. He did some recordings for some European labels, and I think they had, back then it was black and blue. It's probably changed now because, as you know, a lot of these record companies have been bought up by, what, the major threes, mm -hmm. Sony, uh, Concord, not a lot of independent record labels uh, anymore. So um, he, he stayed in Europe for Oh my goodness, he toured there for years until actually until he, uh, he passed away, which he passed away in 1989. But it was a wonderful experience for him too because he got a chance to see and be appreciated. And it's kind of interesting how sometimes we have to leave home to be appreciated. Mm -hmm. But it was a good thing for all of us and he also recorded. And I don't know if you, there was one slide there and it was, um, uh, Showtime, and it was the picture of the Wortham Theater, and that happened to be the first jazz record that, or actually jazz concert that came out of the Wortham Theater when it was first built, and it was uh, Jewel Brown, my dad, and Dizzy Gillespie, so if you get a chance to check that out. But um, it, it's just been a very interesting journey, and I'm very proud of my dad. Um, for the way he loved people and the way he loved music and how he was able to bring those things together. So um, that's kind of it in a nutshell. <laughs> the, the title of this panel is From Texas Tenor to Oilin' Up. And some of you may have thought, well, we, we know what Texas Tenor is, but what is Oilin' Up? Oiling Up is an expression used by Houston musicians, particularly HSPVA graduates, when they get together to jam, when they run into each other, let's just say in the Netherlands. Let's oil, let's oil it up. Uh, the link between the HSPVA generation of musicians and the original generation of Texas tenors is Shelley Carroll. Is there a, an active link for this slide here? No, okay. Well, fortunately, <laughs> We have, this was going to be Shelly Carroll playing down here. Can I, can I hit it? <laughs> hit it. <laughs> nope. Probably someone who wants a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> it's down here, but it's, uh, 
Yeah, but that's the next one. Amazing. What year was that? 1982. And you were how old? Me? Uh, no. <laughs> 17. No, yeah. Business. 17. 17. Yeah. That, that's beautiful. That is Texas tenor right there. Uh, so, Shelly, to ask the obvious, how'd you get so good at such a young age? This man right here. <laughs> he was my high school teacher. <laughs> When, what's your first memory of hearing Arnett Cobb or Illinois Jaquette or, or any of these great rhythm and blues guys that, that had that big honking Texas tenor sound? Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I really, I just, I, it was, it was just a sound. The sound is what really got me. It's like, you know, how do you do that? You know, get a sound that big and it just took over the room and and just, uh, it right. just took everything. You know what I'm saying? And so when I heard Arnett in particular, you know, Arnett Cobb, he was just. Uh, larger than life for me. And uh, the first time I met him in person was Doc had sent, brought him to the school, to HSPBA, to show me that song, Will O' Week For Me, that he did, I guess, with Texas Southern University somewhere. And uh, I had learned the solo, you know, the best I could, but then standing next to him and hearing him, how he played, it was a total, total diff different world, you know. So, I, you know, I was just kind of, standing there and <laughs> just taking it all in. But eventually I got to uh, hang out with Arnett and uh, hear him and, all, and mi his many different sides. He was, you know, it, it, the Texas tenor is, uh, it can be wild and raunchy and, and, you know, and, you know, what we call, you know, the uh, walk in the bar. But it can also be the most tender thing that, the, you know, when you hear an Arnett play the nearness of you. You know, it was just our, our Willow Week for me, which he did, we, which would e exemplify both sides of him, you know, because it was a ballad, then, it then he would rough ride. But it, it, it was just, uh, everything was an extreme almost, you know, I guess you could say. And uh, that's what, uh, you know, that is a part of me now, you know, and, I, you know, and I'm thankful for it. Well, I'm thankful for it. I see that you have a saxophone sitting there. Do, would yes. you like to play for us? Yeah, that's, that's much better than talking. <laughs> no, you do a good job. Some of the things that Arnett, that I did learn from him that <coughs> I, I did not, and I still to this day, I still don't hear tenor player, uh, musicians really do. One of the things, uh, one of his classics is, let me, let me make sure my reader's not watching. <laughs> what Arnett would do is. <laughs> thing that only the tenors see it can seem that, that it comes out of tenor. You don't hear alto players or other instruments really do that, or many tenor players. It's, it seems to be a Texas thing. You know. Billy Harper. Yeah. Billy Harper. Yeah. 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 Uh, and another thing that Arnett did was uh, <laughs> and it's, it's sort of like a clarinet that you, you know, these keys are closed. But on a clarinet, you can half hold them and slide it up. And when I heard him do that on the saxophone in high school, part of my, my biggest thing was learning how to do that. It took me years to be able to do that. You know? <laughs> 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 
not doing it very well right now. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you something are. that I, I did under him, and uh, just a lot of uh, another thing that I had to do. <laughs> One more, one more question. So, a lot of the, uh, you know, kind of the people who are, who develop this way of playing the tenor saxophone have passed on, right? Fathead Newman, uh -huh. Arnett, w Eddie Wilton, Eddie. yeah. Uh -huh, Brad Johnson. So, so, do you feel like you carry this with you when you go out and play with musicians, older and younger, in di even with Cool in the Gang? Now I do. You know, I didn't know that the doc told me. Actually, <laughs> one day, years after yeah. I had left, you know, I had graduated. He's like, we were, uh, we were leaving because of company, and he said, he looked at me and said, Shelly, you know you're a Texas tenor, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, I never really thought about it, you know, and then yeah. the, the older I've gotten, the more I realize this is, is really who I am, you know, yeah. so I never, you know how you don't notice who you are yeah. oftentimes, but the older I've gotten, I've realized that, that this is my style, and it's just the way I play. You know. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, but you know, say, though, the tradition is there, but you can also hear him. You know what I mean? Like a lot of times you are you are um, you're similar. You don't compare, but you're similar to a sound that you've heard before. Mm -hmm. But you still have your own identity. Yeah. When it comes to doing that, and yeah. I, th I thank you for that. Hey, thank that you. moves thank it you. forward. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> I do want to take uh, just a minute to point out that we do have uh, another. Texas tenor, uh, who's going to be in attendance, hopefully, his health permitting, during the lunch hour in the other, the smaller auditorium as part of the Houston Blues Museum exhibit, Grady Gaines, uh -huh. who was the original tenor player with Little Richard, played with Sam Cooke, mm -hmm. and he also does that thing that you did, right, where he bites off that note, like what you yeah, did. I used to go hear him yeah. on my show. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Grady told me a funny story once. The Houston International Festival put Grady's band on in front of the World Saxophone Quartet, these avant-garde jazz guys. And I'm standing there at the side of the stage with David Murray, who's badass, and w he's watching Grady. And when Grady comes off the stage, David comes up to him and says, you're a great saxophone player, man. Why don't you stick around and hear our set? And Grady goes, yeah, yeah, I'd like to, but I got to go play a wedding. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Life of a local legend. Yeah. Let's see if we can, uh, if, if the old man here is not too good at this. Let's see. No, that's not it. Back to here. Can, can, we, can we act that little arrow that you made come up here before? Can we get that?
Everett Harp, of course, gone on to a successful uh, recording career. That Herman Matthews, who I think lives in L.A., I see his name sometimes on recording credits. And the, uh, the young man with the beard in front there was Robert Doc Morgan, 1979. So give us just a little bit of background. You started at HSPBA in what year and what brought you to Houston? You grew up here, right? I'll answer that question, but could I tell a quick story about Shelley Carroll first? Because the timing um, is, is, I can't, I can't um, um, not do tell you this quick story. Um, Shelley's senior year in high school, as has already been mentioned, I think, we played that arrangement that I got from Arnett Cobb, because I knew it would be perfect she for Shelley, because I'd heard, uh, well, I, I had heard all, all of Arnett's arrangements, big band arrangements, so I, I uh, borrowed that one, and uh, we featured Shelley on that arrangement, just about every concert we played as senior year in high school. Anyway, this one occasion we're playing actually at the Houston International Festival. I don't think it was called that back then, but the same thing. We're playing Market Square. A lot of people there, you know. And you know, one name that has not come up today, it's, it's impossible to mention everybody, of course, but the name Jimmy Ford, I hope some of you know. Incredible alto saxophone player. Significant, I even in the history of jazz, the birth of bebop and all that. He, he was a colleague of, of Charlie Parker's and whatever, whatever. Any, anyway, Jimmy's from Houston, had run, had, had some, run into some problems in, in New York, and so came back to Houston at some point and, and never left. But, uh, but still, still uh, was around and still could play if you caught him on the right day. At any rate, the reason I'm mentioning that, uh, here we are getting ready to play at the Houston Festival. Lots of people there, and I look out in the audience, and I see Jimmy Ford. And I think, oh, how cool, Jimmy Ford is here to hear the kid, the kids, the kids, uh, um, you'll always be a kid to me, right? Uh, <laughs> the kids play. And, and you know, then I just forgot about it and we started playing. So uh, third or fourth tune in the set, I introduce um, Shelley and we start playing Willow We For Me. And then uh, I, I expanded the chart where he had this real long solo. Uh, and so I just stepped to the side of the stage, you know, and I just looking around and I noticed Jimmy Ford jumping up and running, leaving, running. And, and I didn't think much about it, but my instant thought was, oh my God, he must be sick at his stomach or something, and, and just they forgot about it. And so we, we finished the set and everything's fine, and I'm, uh, uh, my daughters are there with me and we're just hanging around the festival. An hour or so later, I run into Jimmy. I said, man, are you okay? He said, yeah, what do you mean, am I okay? When I said, well, I saw you checking us out, but then you, you, ran, you got up and ran like maybe you were sick or something. He said, oh, no, man, now, remember, this is way before cell phones. He said, oh, no, man, He's, he pointed across the street. He said, you see that pay phone? I said, well, yeah. He said, when I heard your kid playing Arnett's chart, I ran over there and called Arnett. I was holding the phone up. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> so, so Arnett Cobb could hear your kid playing his chart. Now, that, that I don't know. That I wish that I could... Good. I wish I could put that story on my resume somehow. You know. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> anyway, what Me was too. the question? <laughs> <laughs> what was your secret for developing all of this talent in Houston that has come up? Some, some of them still living here. Some of them have gone on to New York or L.A. What, what, was, what made you the teacher, and I, uh, one teacher to another, how did you do it? Well, of course, it's not just me, <laughs> of course. Um, it's, it, it, have you heard this cliche, it takes a community to raise a child? <laughs> it, 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 um, and it's a, a confluence of things that happen in this city and I don't know has happened any place else. For one thing, HSPBA is a, is a wonderful school. It's an incredibly wonderful school. One, I think one of the best in the world. Of course, I'm prejudiced having taught there 23 years. But m one of my daughters went there, so I saw it from a different perspective with the things she dealt with, you know. And, and, but at any rate, uh, and and I, c I could talk a long time about this, and I don't have much time, but w one reason, okay, it's a wonderful school. There's lots of wonderful schools. But also, this wonderful school, and technically it's a magnet school, but it's interesting. When HSPBA started in 1971, that term didn't even exist. The school started because a woman named Ruth Denny, who had been the very successful drama uh, teacher at Lamar High School, I noticed the name Tommy Sands up there, earlier, and, and he was one of her students, as well as Jacqueline Smith, Tommy Toon, and a bunch of others. But at any, rate, at any rate, Ruth Denny and a very progressive school superintendent named George Garber, so progressive, so cool, he was fired, um, uh, I don't know, somewhere around 1970s. Any, anyway, George Garber and Ruth Denny knew about the, the, the New York 
a fine arts high school, now called LaGuardia, then it was called something else. And just uh, very simply thought Houston should have a school like that. That, that was it. Uh, there was no political reason. No, ju they just thought it would be great to have this school. So, uh, but, but the reason I'm saying all that is from the beginning, the school was supported by the administration. And you, you'd be amazed, at, uh, now, now there's lots of fine arts high schools around the country. You'd be amazed how some of them are not supported by the administration. Why are they there? Because the courts have approved magnet schools as a way to, to, to desegregate schools, school systems. Now, of course, that's a very important issue, but um, there, there are some cities that the courts have told them, you must do this to desegregate your schools, but they, they don't want, they, they don't want um, the, the, the fine arts high school or the, the medical high school or whatever, because, uh, and you know, this again, this is a complicated subject. If, if, if a good student leaves X high school to go to HSBDA, X high school is losing a good student. And, 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 and if I taught at X high school, I wouldn't be too happy about that. And, and so th the whole thing is understandable. But, um, uh, but again, that's, that's a discussion for another time. But the point is, from, from the beginning, HSPBA has been and, and always has been supported by, by the uh, administration, uh, the, the HISD administration, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's one factor. Another thing, the, the famous summer jazz workshop that Craig, I think, still teaches in. I used to teach in it years ago, started by Bubba Thomas and Conrad Johnson. I know Shelley went as a student. And it, it, it started in the early 70s, it's still going. And it's, it's um, if there's any, um, I'll just say, English teachers in the house, <laughs> you know that if a student leaves school in, in May and comes back in September, uh, over the summer, they may have uh, forgotten a lot about English or math or whatever. Well, it's the same with music. And, and so the summer jazz workshop has been a real blessing in this town for PBA students and, and students from every school imaginable to have a place to go to just keep their chops up and, and, and keep their theory fresh or whatever. That's part of the picture. Another part of the picture is, is wonderful feeder programs best represented by Johnston Middle School where my friend Craig taught for how many years? 28, 28, and um, many, many of our best students at PBA came from Craig's program, and it, uh, you know, it made them real easy to teach. So you, you put all that together, and also parents, parents. Um, 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 I, I think without exception at our school, just w wonderful parental support. Of course, that's, that's true at a lot of schools, but still, you put all that together, and, um, and, and uh, I, I feel very fortunate to have taught at that school. I was teaching at Sam Houston State, I was head of the jazz program there, and and um, I I I'd been there a while and got kind of bored and and um, um, wanted to change, but didn't want to leave the area. And H HSPBA had opened, and actually I started going by there recruiting <laughs> kids to come to Sam Houston with some success. But as I as I would hang out there, and of course HSPBA way back then wasn't wasn't anything like now, but it was still a very stimulating uh, place from from the day it opened. And and I just became very attracted attracted to it. So um, at, at first there was, in fact, I'm I'm glad to have a chance to to um, bring this name up. My predecessor was a gentleman named Edward Edward Ed Edward Trangoni, long long deceased now, but he was he was chosen by Ruth Denny to be the first. Um, and and of course when it opened there there was just one music guy because that's that's all the the uh, student body uh, at, at first was very small. And so they would only fund one person. But he was a very interesting man. He had come to Houston in the 40s to play oboe in the Houston Symphony, which at that time was not a full-time uh, contract. So one had to do something else to pay one's bills. He was also a dance band baritone sax player, <laughs> in addition to being oboist in the symphony. Now, Ed, Ed could not solo. He could not improvise. But being a dance band baritone sax player, he could phrase. He, he, he understood the idiom, and he could teach. He could basically, to get a little bit technical, teach kids how to play jazz eighth note, you know, but he, he couldn't teach them the, the changes, but th that, that, that doesn't matter. But he, he was the perfect person to get the program started. And then um, when, he, uh, when they got funding for their second full-time person, he called me one day and said, um, um, uh, any, anyway, he, he called me and wanted me to c come by and talk to him and Mrs. Denny, Ruth Denny, and he said, if you were thinking about coming here, I'll, I'll let you take the jazz program, and I'll keep the orchestra and, and the wind ensemble and all that. And and so I, I said, well, yeah, I'm, I'm interested. So my friends thought I was nuts. By that point, I had tenure at the university and all that. But but anyway, 
but any, I, I wasn't, oh, excuse me, I wasn't sure it was the right decision, but um, I decided to do it. And, and man, I, I, um, I'm really glad I did. <laughs> to have, I mean, um, you, you, you heard this young man playing a few minutes ago, and that's when he was still in high school. And, and to have talent like that, and it's still coming. I'll, I'll just tell you one more story th uh, quickly. There, of course, I've, I'm, um, I've been retired since 1999. And um, I actually, I'm, I'm, I started to say I'm happy to say I'm a little bit perturbed. The school seems to be doing great without me. But <laughs> You keep your eye out. There's a young piano player that, that's at the school now. His name, I, th I think I'm going to get this right, is Tyler Henderson. It's a very interesting story. His family moved here so he could go to HSPBA. Th th uh, as I understand, I chatted with his dad once or twice. Uh, his dad's in the computer world and does very well but works out of his home so can live any place. And um, they realized their son had this extra talent, which he does, and um, so living, in, I don't know where in New York, but at any rate, they lived in New York State and researched every fine arts high school in the country mm. and chose HSPBA. And they, they li literally moved here for this young man to go to HSPBA. And you watch out for him. Um, just a month ago, I heard the, the current HSPBA combo with not only him playing piano, but three arrangements of his that were just staggering, the harmonic sophistication, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and and I, I could keep naming James Francis. He's he, I hope you all know about Jason Moran and Helen Sung and Robert Glasper. James Francis, I think, is going to be the next one. Incredible piano player now in New York. He's already subbing for um, what's his name on, on uh, with the Roots. He's subbing for the piano player on on uh, J Jimmy Fallon. You know, and he's he's a sophomore at the new school in New York. <laughs> so at any rate, the kids keep coming, and it's it's still a great school. And um, uh, I, I think I'll stop there. That's. I'm not getting any time. <laughs> hey, Mr. Trump ignored the timer, so I can. <laughs> I, can <laughs> I can too, right? And my, my hair is better than his. So. Yes, it is. Everything is better. No comment. <laughs> uh, I was uh, fortunate to uh, attend the Newport Jazz Festival this past summer, uh, last week of July. And on the main stage, on the final day, there were a couple of bands, uh, the Charles Lloyd Quartet, with Jason Moran on piano and Eric Harland on drums, and coming on right after him, the Robert Glasper band, featuring Robert Glasper on piano, Bernice Travis on bass, and Jamara Williams on drums. All five of those guys went to HSPVA. This is the most prestigious jazz festival in the world, and uh, Eric also played later that day with Dave Holland, the great bass player. And of those names that I just mentioned, two of them, were taught by this guy right here, Craig Green. Before they got to HSPVA, Craig either gave them private lessons or they attended Johnson Middle School or both, Eric Harland and Jamar Williams. Let's see if we can activate this. Can, can you do the YouTube right here? This is, this is Craig Green when he was in high school, 1974. Conrad, when did you get the idea to start a band with, of this semblance? Well, I got the idea when I was working at Washington quite a few years ago, Washington High School. Here in Houston? In Houston, right. I got the idea to start a band and build a band out of young people that was equivalent to, in sound and in appearance, to that of the profession. This has been one of my goals and one of my aims. That was the voice of Conrad Johnson, otherwise known as Prof. Back. Yeah.
back when Houston schools were still segregated, this band would go to local, regional, and national competitions and beat, you know, bands coming from rich suburban high schools. They, they, who knows how many contests they won. They also were putting out albums, and some of those recordings have been collected, and it's n you can hear them now uh, on a triple CD. Uh, Cashmere, what, I can't think of the title of it off the top of my head. It's up there in the sound booth. Yeah, four, four Corners. Yeah, Four Corners. Mm -hmm. So, Craig, is there, like we've talked about the Texas tenor, is there a Houston drum sound where that these guys have and share in common when they're quote unquote oiling up? Well, um, th th I would say s there is a Houston sound, there's a, a definite Houston sound that's founded in uh, hands. You know, I think one of the most common characteristics that most people have told me about the drummers that are very notable uh, globally now are their hands and the comfort and the speed at which they have with their hand technique. And uh, that's one of the things that I know when I worked with them as students, we focused on a lot. Also, I think the discipline of understanding the, the kit as, a, as an instrument, because a lot of people when they hear about, well, play the drums, well, they just thinking about beating on something. And my philosophy with young drummers is always to teach them that this is an instrument no less than a clarinet, a flute, or a saxophone, whatever. There are things you need to learn. There's a discipline about approaching it. And you need to become a student of your instrument with your skill and, you, and your ears. So I, I think you know, drilling those kinds of ideas and modeling them for the students while I've had them, you know, I think kind of helped to establish that foundation. One uh, other thing that I, I've wondered about, just like Texas tenors sometimes got their early training in blues bands where they didn't solo all that much, but they learned to play tight charts and have this big sound, a lot of young African-American drummers in Houston got their start playing in church. Mm -hmm. Is there something to kind of that choppy gospel rhythm that when it gets integrated into swing gives it a distinct sound? Well, you know, interesting you would say that because I'm, I'm glad you noticed that because that is a characteristic that I, I've also come to appreciate from young drummers starting in a black gospel church. Now, I don't know how many people in here have had the experience of going to a black church service, but sometimes we, say, we see people that we say get happy. They're full of the Holy Spirit. And when they get full of the Holy Spirit, you know, they're jumping around, they're waving their hands, they're praising the Lord. And, uh, and when the preacher is preaching and he gets really caught up in the spirit, he does something what we call hoop. And when he starts hooping, well, that's signal for the, the musicians to start supporting what he's doing as a preacher. And, to, and I've noticed that that's a time where the drummer can get to really express possibly any idea that he has in his mind. So it's an opportunity for them to work on whatever they want to work on that seems like it's, it's supporting the preacher, but it's also, hey, this is my chance to get a solo in, <laughs> <laughs> you know, behind the preacher. <laughs> so I think those kinds of experiences where they're, where they're learning to listen and follow the lead and learn how to elevate and uh, soothe that whole environment, I think is another good training experience for them. I mentioned Eric Harlan and Jamara Williams. Who are a few of the other drummers that you taught who've gone on to greater things, and who, who are they with now, or who have they been with? You know, I, 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 I can't, you know, I don't like to start naming names because you leave somebody out, but um, I know that um, Chris Day has his own group. He's played with, you know, everybody from Kenny Garrett to Adele. Uh, he has his own group, uh, drum heads that's doing a lot of innovative things. Uh, Mark Simmons plays with Al Jarreau. Again, PV, these are all PVA uh, alum. Uh, he's been with Al Jarreau for over 20 years. Uh, Kendrick Scott, you know, interesting story. I, I didn't teach Kendrick Scott directly, but Kendrick lived two blocks from Eric Harlan in Pleasantville, and uh, Jamar Williams also lived in Pleasantville. 
and I'm from Pleasantville, so it's something in the water in Pleasantville <laughs> that uh, you know just ran through a, li a lineage of drummers, and Corey Cox is doing a lot of things, and uh, Reginald Quinterly, and uh, it's, it's just, it's, uh, as a matter of fact, tomorrow night in Houston at the White Oak Theater, uh, Dustin Kaufman is playing with a group called St. Lucia, so they're on a worldwide tour right now, so you know, they're just doing great things. Who was the first? Eric Harlan would be the first. Oh, oh. oh well. The first student, of, well, I taught, I started, I said Eric Harlan was the first because I, I started teaching Eric when he was six years old. But the first student I started teaching, who I met in the summer jazz workshop when I started teaching in the summer jazz workshop was in 1983, and that was Sebastian Whitaker. And the thing about Sebastian that caught my attention, not wasn't that he was blind, but, but because he had such an understanding of drums and drumming when I met him, he was interested not only in being a great player, but he was interested in orchestrating and arranging and, and performing at a high level. And, um, you know, Sebastian took what I did with hands and he extended it to another level with the fingers. And so when the students, as he matured and grew, um, he kept, he continued performing, but students started going to him when he finished PVA to get that next level of training after they left me. So the, for me, they had hands. Sebastian, they developed the finger touch and that whole concept of what you hear now. We had uh, 55 minutes allotted for this panel, and we're almost there. We have a clip of Sebastian, who, by the way, passed away this year. When, when I first moved to Houston, uh, well, shortly after when I moved to Houston, in the early 90s, he was recording for Justice Records. He was the most in-demand jazz drummer in town, you know, of his generation. And I, I, w I can show you this clip uh, while we're kind of changing the set, perhaps. Um, anybody got any questions? We have to keep it pretty brief because we're about to run out of time. Anyone? Yes, sir. May I? I have a suggestion. There is a program on Monday nights called the Monday Night Jazz Jam, and it's over off of Almeda. Uh, it's next to the, I'm sorry, say it again now. Cafe 4212, that's it. And it's next to the, what is that, the sophomore post, post office? Mm -hmm. But they have a program over there every Monday night, and they have a core band. And then they, if you want to bring your instrument, um, you sat, you talk to TR, <laughs> I'll, I'll hook you up. <laughs> I'll hook you up with that for sure. <laughs> that's, that's a nice place to start, you guys. Well, and this is a good chance to bring up another name that should be mentioned, David Catney. David Catney, uh, one of the best piano players ever to live here. Uh, been deceased now, I guess a dozen years. But uh, Cezanne, have you been to Cezanne? Yeah, well, that, I'm sorry, that's about it. <laughs> I mean, for a true listening room. Yeah. Uh, Cezanne, if you haven't been there, above the Black Lab restaurant, it's only open Fridays and Saturdays, 9 to midnight. Um, it only seats about 50. It's like hearing jazz in your living room. It's 90% it's, uh, of the time it's, it's local musicians, but uh, I shouldn't say but, but I mean, but... <laughs> There's some wonderful local musicians, you know, um, many of whom, or at least some of whom, a lot of you have never heard. And and um, and every every now and then, uh, a New York or L.A. that type of musician will play there. Um, That's what I was going to exactly. say. Exactly. Change that, Bobby Hinton. Th this exactly. is the fourth largest city in the world, and there is not only really there's no place for people like Jason Moran to play when they come home unless they arrange their their own concert. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, uh, one, 30 seconds, is for the newbies here, when Cezanne first opened, when Dave Catney first opened it, uh, there was music, I think, six nights a week, maybe five, but there, the, uh, Joe Lacasio had his own night. Every Wednesday night, Joe Lacasio would play a solo piano Cezanne. There was, there was a night that was singer's night, once a week. And, and then, you know, the policy on the weekend, um, like now, uh, is like it is now. But th the point is, when it first opened, it was five or six nights a week. It worked at first, but then as the newness wore, wore off, <laughs> it started slowing down. And then, you know, th then a night was cut, then another night was cut. Um, and, and then Dave passed away, and I, I'm sure he was putting his own money into it, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's, it's, it's for those two nights, it's still really, really, really good. But it's, uh, it's not, it back when it first opened, it was really magic. So Thank anyway. you. Thank you. One quick thing, as you meet the musicians here, then you get to know them, and then you can say, well, where are you playing? What are you doing? And because there's a lot of things going on. It's just not always known or it may not be in a big venue or something that, um, you know, it gets the airplay or the f ends up in the newspaper or whatever. But people, the people who work and eat off of that, they, they find a way. They're, they're out there. I'm, I'm a child of a eat off of my daddy went to work every night, <laughs> you know, somewhere. So, yeah, yeah I think that'll work. I'm not sure where Shelly went, but can we please have a round of applause? Had to catch a flight to Dallas.